Hi folks, my name is Girish Bally, the host for Back to Basics, another Back to Basics for another week. You know, in season two, we've been talking about many, many different topics, but there's one topic that I've touched once, and now I'm going to touch it again today, and that is mental health. Mental health, depression, meditation, those are the words that we'll be using today on this episode. But what did this person go through in order to do these things? Because you know what? Someone has to go through a certain journey, a certain trigger. And this person is Nita. And she's a great person to talk to. She chatted. We had some malfunctions right before this call. But you know what? You know what? We go through certain things and we went through it. And now we're finally here on the show and talking to her in detail, in the basic way with my guest today. How are you? And thanks for coming to uh, Back to Basic. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Absolutely. Thank you again for coming here on Back to Basics. But before we get into the details of meditation, depression, mental health, your running, your dogs, what does Back to Basic mean to you? I would say... Because I'm easily overwhelmed, it's chunking things down into the smallest possible step. Hmm. So sometimes that's getting out of bed. Sometimes that's figuring out where your cell phone is before you have to make a cell phone call, turning on the computer, just opening the laptop, opening the file, tiny little actions that may lead to something much, much larger much, much more important or bigger, but that little tiny action is not scary, is not overwhelming, is very, very doable. So when I think of back to basics, that's kind of how I think of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again, Nita, for, for coming here and uh, making this brighter for me, uh, because it's it's more, uh, it's my honor for you to be on my show. I, I think it's the, I don't know if it's the other way around, but thank you again for coming here. So oh, it's definitely an honor to be anytime <laughs> anyone has me on a show that it makes me feel so good because I, I kind of have a message to share and, and anytime someone shares their platform so I can talk to the people that listen to them, it's, you know, I mean, you don't just let anybody in your house. So that's right. That's right. So thank uh, So if, if that's the case, then thank you for coming into my house uh, for that. So let me ask you this question, depression, mental health, these are the two words that it, it seems like it's a uh, a taboo topic that we usually don't talk about in public. But do you think that we should be talking about it? Because if we talk about it in public, people will say that Girish or Nita is crazy and they're mental and we just don't want to be near them. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that there's an opportunity for education. I'll give you an example. Recently, my husband and I went to San Diego to visit my stepson, mm. and we went through the tour of, um, I'll just say a museum there, and one of the docents noticed my sweatshirt, which happened mm. to say Mental Health Runner. Mm. It's a sweatshirt from another group I'm in called Still I Run. And he looked at me and he said, what the heck's a mental health runner? And he kind of laughed. He said, you know, you just run because you're crazy. Mm. And I said, yeah, actually, I do. <laughs> and I laughed. You know, it was I realized that there was a door. He mm. didn't understand. And I had a chance to react badly, to be offended, to, mm. um, you know, get upset. But instead, I told him what I do. I talked about the book that I've written about it. I talked about my journey of having chronic depression and bipolar disorder and how the movement, the running for me, but movement was kind of the missing piece in mm. my mental health toolkit mm. because I have other parts, more traditional parts like medication and therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't, until I found the movement, um, I also meditate, um, I didn't, it didn't make me more whole. It didn't bring me to the place I am now. Mm. And, and so he understood and he kind of nodded and you know, I didn't make him feel bad. I, we just sort of laughed together because um, I kind of use the word crazy sometimes. I mean, maybe that's derogatory, but I have definitely felt crazy. I have definitely felt like I was unstable. So mm. that's the word that he relates to. Um, 
that's fine. Let's start there and see if we can have a conversation. So, so let, let me ask you this, because when we when we say that we have uh, mental issues, OK, or disorder, whatever word you want to use, does that make you a, a victim or does that make you a person who says that go to hell, I'm going to make it work? I think of it more in terms of acceptance, because hmm. until I knew um, what I was up against, what I was dealing with, I didn't know what tools would help. Hmm. And so I did feel like a victim. I hmm. did feel out of control in my life. Um, hmm. But once I had a diagnosis and other people that knew more about it, whether they were professionals or other people with the same symptoms, hmm. it was empowering. Um, hmm. Just to know that I wasn't alone was a big hmm. deal, but hmm. also to have um, help in terms of you could try this or you could try that uh, to, I, to be able to step forward into my life. Because hmm. before that, I just thought I was crazy. And, sure. Um, or that in my family, there wasn't a lot of room for being weak, shall we say. Hmm. And I felt weak a lot of the time. Um, there wasn't a lot of room for being emotional. And I am an emotional person. I still am. Um, and so I felt wrong. I felt ashamed. And so when I found other people who could explain what was going on with me and who some of whom related mm. i felt more normal i felt like i belonged and um and i'm not saying bad things about my parents they uh my mother especially had her own issues but my father was just a very strong stoic man he may have had a little depression but he never faced anything like what i eventually had and it was very confusing and i think scary to him and his remedy for everything was, you know, get a bigger hammer, <laughs> work harder, so, put in more hours. So, but but the example that you're giving, that sounds like maybe hmm, that they didn't want to talk no, about the they, problem. Right. Well, they didn't understand it. That was that was the biggest thing. And I think they came from a generation where hmm. it wasn't okay to talk about it. You know, you put hmm. the crazy people in the closet. You hid aunt whatever um you sent her to the home or you uh, made it look like everything was fine mm. and especially in the last few years it's come to light that there's a lot more people suffering than we thought mm. and that pushing it aside and you know, sweeping it under the carpet so to speak right it's not working it's not working <laughs> and mm. so we have to find other ways so yeah yeah you're right i mean i think that that's uh, um one of the mottos that I try to live by, by is to end the stigma, is to try to normalize conversations around mental health, because if we can get used to talking about it and hearing about it, it becomes part of our world, as opposed to something that we can make fun of or something that the person involved, myself or whoever would be ashamed of. Um, so yeah, it's. Uh, I think that we have. I, I think that my family was in the place of let's not talk about this. Yeah. And over the years, we have become, with the rest of the culture, more used to hearing about it, talking about it, reading about it, seeing all kinds of media about it, and it's getting a lot more attention. You know, uh, thank you again, by the way, for for that. You know, uh, this is my observation, not anyone else's. But what I've noticed is that baby boomers and Gen Xs are the people that you are explaining that you don't want to talk about it and brush it under the, brush it under the mat. The Gen Ys and Zs, I think they want to talk and they want to collaborate. But then people like us, the Xs and the Gen, you know baby boomers, they're like, you know what? I think you need to hold back. I don't think I'm ready. Is that my observation wrong, or what do you think no, on I that? No, I think that's probably right. It could be generational. Um, I think that uh, in general, all of the generations are hearing more about it and maybe getting used to hearing more about it. But there's some parts of a person that are never going to change. And so even though they may be a little more open to it, um, you know, that may be, there may always be a resistance and mm. we just have to deal with that. Mm. 
Yeah, I, yeah. I think continuing to talk about it um, without glamorizing it or you know making it oh I have the disease of the month we, that's not what I'm talking about at all. Of course I'm not. Talking about authenticity, and and there's a place even if someone is reticent to hear something. There is a way to talk about things where you're authentic and mm. you come from your own experience, your own truth, that you hit something in another person, even if they do have that resistance, and you can reach them. Mm. Now, it may not look like that on the outside, mm -hmm. but, um, but I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with people who were just not really... Totally I interested, and then later, you know, they emailed me or got back in touch. It's like they had to have time to digest. Sure, it. sure, sure. Yeah. So, thank you again, by the way, uh, for that. Um, there's this one uh, question that I had before we go into the meditation and running part of things. Is mental health uh, another word? Um, you think that people have gone through a certain child abuse? when they go through that? Have you thought of that? No. Yes, I have thought about that. You know, I'm not a mental health professional. No, no, no. This is from your experience and your yeah, thought process. Yeah. So I, I, I'm reticent to say what the actual cause is. I know that I have a family history of mental health issues. I've had several family members generations back um, take their own lives, you know, die by suicide. I've had um, a lot of alcoholism in my family. A lot of depression, people who have been unable to function well in society. And so I'm sure that there's probably a genetic component, mm. but there's also, you know, there's the, it's kind of the nature versus nurture question. If you have a propensity for something, but you are nurtured in a very, very positive way, I don't know if you won't, would end up, um, in a situation where, you know, you end up less mentally ill, if you'll say, I know that I have the genetic predisposition and I come from a family of people who have um, those issues. And my parents did the best they could, but my mother had her own mental health issues. And my father was very um, confused, I think, about how to deal with it all. Sure, and sure. So, and so that was his message was let's not talk about this or let's, you know, just act normal. Um, so the, the secrets, yeah. but Nita, uh, uh, you know, I want to explain to my audience if that's okay with you. So, you know, there was an episode, um, it was called demographic versus value graphic. So demographic means that a person has different, different age groups, different, different geograph, you know, uh, locations where they are at. Okay. And today's world, what Nita has even uh, uh, noticed, it seems like we are more vocal. We want to talk about it. So that's where your value graphic comes in. So now we're taking inputs from even a person at the age of 10. Uh, so I think that's the world we're living in. And that was one of the episodes that I did uh, on my season one. So when Nita, when you get a chance, listen to that, because it's quite interesting of how uh, I, I divided between the two uh, verses, 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 you know, and uh, it's something to think about. So thank you again for Anita for uh, for explaining all all the stuff that you did there. Meditation, meditation and running. You think this is more of your um, what is the word that I'm looking for? Cocaine high, <laughs> because you you feel good right after doing these two items. What are your thoughts on that? Well, the meditation is more. I mean, sometimes you feel good, but sometimes it's just a practice and staying in the moment. One of my largest symptoms, my most difficult symptoms with my mental health issues is anxiety. Mm. And if I can keep my mind where my body is, there might be some agitation, some mm. body sensations of fear, some thoughts of fear. Mm. But often the anxiety is actually in the future. It's mm. a fear of something that hasn't yet happened. It's a fear of something that happened in the past that might occur again. So it's mm. not in this moment. And mm. so the meditation helps bring me right in this moment, which is usually safe, not always, mm. um, but it's usually safe. And it's usually there's some pleasantness, even if it's minor. I can find a bit of, of 
pleasantness in the present moment. So meditation so is it. basically more for you, like inner you. Is that correct? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, it is. And it helps with the depression because if I see the biggest thing about meditation, in addition, I mean, it brings you in the moment, but, but you see that everything is passing as we're sitting here. That's right. As I'm sitting here, um, you know, any anxiety I had, I could watch it arise and pass away. And it, it, go, it comes and goes. It's not this solid, hard block. It's mm. much more of a flow. So and that is reassuring. So. No, no, no. Go ahead. Please, please. Yeah. No, no. Go With for it. depression, the body sensations tend to be heavy. They tend to be very hard and heavy mm. and that kind of like a feel, it feels almost like you have weights on your body that are dragging you down. Yes. And if you, if I, um, can be with those sensations and also the thoughts of, oh, it's always going to be like this, I'm not worth anything, because all that happens also in very negative self-thought. Right. If I can see all those coming and going and just stay with them as they come and go, then it, it, doesn't hurt as bad. I don't know how to say it. It just doesn't hurt as bad because I'm not adding an extra layer on top of it. I'm just dealing with exactly what's going on. And mm. that makes it um, less draining. It gives me a little bit more energy if I'm in a depressive episode. So that's, that's kind of the biggest thing with meditation for me, for mental health. Um, they're sort of all tied together for me because I live with mental sure. health issues. Um, and so with meditation, especially the depression and anxiety, those are, those are the way that they, that uh, meditation really helps with them. But I want to explain to everyone here that this meditation and the depression that Nita has gone through is basically for her, how she has handled it. You might be handling it something different, which oh, absolutely. this one works for her, not for, for everyone. Uh, yeah. But if it works the same way as Nita, God bless you, because I mean, then then Nita has found the way to to channelize uh, in a different way. But Nita, before we go into your running thing, just very quickly, uh, when people they go through grief and they have lost someone, what are your thoughts? I know that you're not an expert on that, but do you think this is also part of the depression and and grieving? And meditation is the right way to also. Um. Meditation definitely helped me with grief in, as I wrote in um, my first book, yes. Depression Hates a Moving Target, there was a period of time, 11 months, where seven people and a cat that I loved mm. died. Mm. And those included my 24-year-old niece, my father-in-law, and my mother. They all, mm. Those and four other people died, and the cat, um, my niece's cat, all died. And so the grief was overwhelming. Mm. And again... Grief is made up of thoughts and body mm. sensations. Mm. Sometimes they're so painful, they feel like they're going to kill you. They just mm. do. They take your breath away. It feels mm. like somebody's, especially when a memory will arise. Um, I remember being in a grocery store. This was actually after my father died. Um, being in a grocery store and coming around a corner and seeing a case of a food he loved and he would cook all the time. Mm. And I just, I... I, I fell to the floor. I just, sure. it was so unexpected. So, you know, I was just doing my shopping and the feeling was so powerful. Um, again, if I can be with the feeling and not add an extra, I mean, it's bad enough. The feeling is bad enough. But if I can not add an extra layer on top of it and have the experience of those sensations coming and going mm. and not being this solid thing the way they feel often mm. at first. And also the, um, you know, the thoughts of there's so many with family members, especially it can be so complicated because sure. when they're gone, you can't repair anything that was damaged. You That's won't right. have the joy of them again. I mean, it's, they're so very gone. Death is mm. just the, it's just the, um, the big thing, big thing. And so the meditation helped because it just helped me be with the exact thing that was happening and not add anything to it because the exact thing that was happening was tough enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So for me, grief is, but yeah, uh, you know, I want to say something too about, about this, that this is my story. I write memoir. That's write right. Nonfiction from my experience. Um, and there are a million different ways to meditate. I happen to practice mindfulness meditation. I'll, 
um, often called insight or vipassana, and that's one type of meditation. Um, and there are also many other things that aren't meditation that help that's right. other people. That's right. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying this is the only way. This is just the thing, a tool that has really helped me. Yes, yes, yes. No, I, I wanted to make sure that other people understand that too. And, and you are right. I mean, this, this, uh, uh, the way that you're doing and to let go and to feel better, this is the path that you chose. So I totally agree with that. Uh, but before we go and talk about running, uh, sorry for your loss uh, of what you have gone through because I was reading that and that's why I brought that topic up. So I, I really apologize. And, uh, you know, uh, all the prayers are there. Uh, let's take a deep breath if you don't mind. <laughs> uh, because uh, sometimes you also do need to let go and just go back to basics on that. So thank you again for that. Running. Now, where did this start? I mean, what what is this? I mean, you... Really? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah, so where did, the, where did this start? Because my brother-in-law uh, runs too. He does marathons. He's done uh, Ironman. He's done uh, Ultraman. He's done... Uh, the 777 uh, marathons, and I'll talk to you about that offline if you want. Uh, but what are your thoughts on these things? Uh, on Where did this start? Well, I saw a social media post of a high school friend. Hmm. And I was on the sofa. It was about a year and a half after all those people and the cat had died. Hmm. And my chronic depression, which comes and goes had come back and I was in a very dark place, very, very dark. Hmm. And my high school friend who was, I think she's a year older than me, about the same size I was at that time, posted, call me crazy, but this running is getting to be fun. And I thought we should really have her checked out. I thought she'd lost it. I just hmm. couldn't imagine running being fun. I was not having any fun. Um, and I, I wasn't running yet. But uh, just couldn't imagine running being fun at all. Mm -hmm. But I watched her because she did seem to be having fun. And she was doing an interval training plan. It took me a couple of months to check out the plan. And when I did, it said 60 seconds of jogging. Now, it said a lot more other things, too. It said a lot more than just that. But something about 60 seconds of jogging seemed doable. And I didn't start right away, but uh, one day when kind of all the neighbors were gone, husband was at work, I leashed up the dog and walked down to the secluded ravine area in our neighborhood because I didn't really want anybody to see me. I had, you know, old sweatpants on and probably had Velcro tennis shoes. I don't remember exactly. I think I had trail shoes, but I wasn't dressed like what I thought a runner mm. would look like. And I was very overweight. And... I thought I was too old. I thought a lot of things, none of which were true. Um, and I took a digital kitchen timer, one of those little white plastic digital timers down there with me and set it for 60 seconds. And I stood there a long time before I finally hit the timer and just started jogging. Mm. And something about the combination of the exercise, of course, but the doing something out of my comfort zone doing something on a schedule, having this friend doing it also, even though I didn't tell anybody for a long time, but I knew that we were sort of doing it together, even though, you know, like I said, mm -hmm. I didn't tell mm -hmm. my husband for a while. It started shifting things. It really started shifting things. And eventually I ran all the way out of the ravine into the, into the, into the neighborhood where people could see me. <laughs> it took a while. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how it started. It just started with this, me having a really bad day and opening, opening up my laptop and seeing this post from this friend and going, what is she doing? And then watching her for a while. Hmm. So I would like to say, never, never assume that you're not an inspiration. I mean, hmm. never. People hmm. are watching. People, if you do something even remotely inspiring, people are watching. And um, it's... We're all, we can be a good example. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, but, uh, and then, go ahead. Yeah. 
but but in a, a certain age i'm not uh you know in certain age people they say that their knees are going to go bad or i'm going to get tired uh i have asthma issues what what are your thoughts on on that should we overcome these fears well i think that you have to work with what you have i have lots of runner friends who are marathoners who carry inhalers with them who hit their that have asthma who hit their inhalers before they begin to run. Hmm. Uh, the research says that running is actually good for your knees. Hmm. If you run with good shoes and good form. So it's, it's like anything else. There's a technique that you can do to get better at it. Hmm. You know, it's kind of funny. We think, oh, we'll just go run. Well, yeah, sort of. But there are ways to run that are easier on your body. So I work with that. Because I was 49 when I or for, might have been 48, I was just shy of 50 when I started running. Hmm. And I've been running for over 10 years now, and you know I think you work with what you what you have. So I never want to say that you should do anything, but the part that I'll go back to is the structure. For me, it was a training plan. <clears throat> I like sure. checking things off. I did this. I did this. That's right. Okay, I do this, and also not having to make a decision. The training plan says, do this. Okay, I don't have to decide. I just follow the training plan. The camaraderie, eventually I joined a group. But in the beginning, I still had the camaraderie of that other person, even though she didn't know I was running, but there were two of us. Then, of course, the endorphins of the, of the movement, which actually there's endocannabinoids, the, um, is the more powerful neurotransplanter that mm. you don't hear as much about. So all of those things together, combined, I think, to give me the boost that was missing with the other parts of my mental health toolkit. I had therapy, I was meditating, I'm a long time meditator, and I had, I was on medication. Mm. In fact, I was on a lot of medication. Sure, <laughs> sure. But Nita, let me, let me ask you this, if you don't mind, uh, more of an analogy, if you think about it. What I have found out from other people is when they s quit smoking, it takes at least 10 days till that craving goes away. When was that one craving, a one, when was that time that you felt that that hurdle went away from a person who's trying to quit running and trying again and not falling off the bandwagon when, uh, around the schedule? When was that I, moment? Well, I think that, you know, that happens all the time. It, okay, okay. It, all, it doesn't, that, you know, I think that's, I think that's the, um, maybe the myth or the dream that eventually it's just going to be easy. It's just going to be easy. But the practice of whether it's meditation or having a group to run with, um, being in a dance club, taking tennis lessons, whatever your form is, there always will come a day when it's not easy. That's and right. And continuing to show up, that's why I talk about the tiny goals. Hmm. So some days when I don't feel like running, I just put on my shoes. Oh. And then see what happens. And then usually, you know, I might want to change into other running gear also. And so, so it gets easy. So does it get easier or does it get easier? <laughs> so it's it like... Gets yeah, well, it depends on the day. I mean, there are days when it's just been... Um, of course, of course. Yeah, but no, it's it's easier definitely than it was in those first days. Of course, I mean, of the, course. The physical activity gets easier, because you, but you're building all kinds of muscles. You're building physical muscles, but you're building mental muscles. Hmm. And that helps you with momentum. And then on the days when the mental muscles don't work, you've hmm. got fear of missing out because your friends are over around the trail running and you're not that's right that's why the group is important or you've got a race oh my gosh we're going to virginia beach in a couple of weeks i better get some miles in so i can show up for that race mm -hmm. i put some money down you know or i made a bet with a friend that we you know we would do this 5k and i'll lose ten dollars if i don't run the race and what you have to figure out what works for you um some people are really competitive so I, so I think you were afraid of 
So you were afraid of losing that ten bucks more than than, than the five. No, I don't. I no, no, I'm I'm kidding. Much of a bet. No, that's but that's a good point. Um, because you might find that the bet doesn't you the bet you don't care sure. about ten bucks, and so it's not enough on the line. That's right. That's <laughs> but, right. Uh, that's right. But yeah, but what what I'm saying is it's um so we're we're just so individual that you have to find the thing that really works for you. That's and right. For me, it was a structured plan. So there was the structure, the lack of decision making. And then the dopamine hit of checking the little box next to having done that day's workout. And eventually the group support kind of fear of missing out, but more camaraderie Hmm. of other people who had been here before. And um, let's see what else. A little bit of competitiveness because I do like, um, I'm not fast, but I can say now that I've run three full marathons. I can say now that I've run more than a hundred shorter races, you know, 30 half marathons, things like that. Those numbers um, feed that competitive part of me. Hmm. So all of that is kind of going on together. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I went to your website and I saw the picture of all the medals that you have on the on that wall. So uh, it's it's more than three. I'll tell you that. So. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, yeah. So thank you again for that. You are also very briefly, you are an author. Uh, you have a book. Uh, you talked about the first book. Can you explain briefly about the other other uh, books that you have? Yes, the second book is actually a writing journal. It's called You Should Be Writing, and it's blank pages. They're lined, but it's a blank book. And at the top of every page is an author quote. The woman that I wrote it with, my co-author Brenda Knight, and I have been to tons of writing conferences where we've heard really bad writing advice. And so we thought we would put together a book of good writing advice. And so I collected quotes from various authors and they're organized kind of by topic mm. um, about different aspects of writing, sure, motivational sure. craft, things like that. And um, yeah, so it's, and it has little tiny essays. I'm talking about two or three sentence essays at the beginning of each of those little chapters, but mostly it's a place for people to write their thoughts, their, maybe their first draft or something, maybe notes. Um, that's a journal. And then this, the third book, which I'm very excited about, will be coming out in August. It was actually featured in the Wall Street Journal in a roundup of books about the mind-body connection. It's called Make Every Move a Meditation, hmm. Mindful Movement for Mental Health, Well-Being, and Insight. And it's about how to meditate while you exercise. Or mm. while you move. So it could mm. be walking, it could be tennis, it could be Zumba, pickleball, anything. Mm. It it takes the structure of meditation practice, the instruction of meditation practice, and it, instead of the posture being sitting, which is what we usually learn, the posture is movement. Yeah. And it adapts meditation to any kind of movement form. Oh, well, no, when, like when, when, when the third book uh, comes out, then we'll, we'll talk more in detail about that. So thank you again, Nita, for That's explaining great. that. Uh, but before you leave today, do you have any last words uh, for my listeners and my viewers? And how was your journey on uh, Back to Basics so far? Oh, this has been a great conversation. I appreciate the questions. I appreciate the way you direct the question um, and maybe challenge a little bit that's good that's good to have that little bit of a question but what do you mean what do you mean that's that really helps but my basic thing is again tiny goals just remember that you don't have to do it all today Hmm. you just go in the direction of what you want or need to do i mean i always want to do it but sure just head that direction even if it's just getting out of bed and um and also give yourself a little pat on the back we're, life is really tough right now. Life has been tough for a lot of people for a while now. And so, mm. you know, try to be your own little cheerleader and cheer other people on too, if you can. You know, mm. your neighbor does something great, just give them a little clap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you again for, uh, Nita, for coming here and uh, explaining to me all the details that you have done so far about mental health, the meditation, and definitely the running, and definitely that 10 bucks that you uh, earned also. Uh, So thank you. Thank you again for coming here and uh, making this brighter for me. And thank you for all the support that you've given me so far. Oh, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. 
So guys, we spoke with Nita today and we talked about the basics of mental health. We talked about depression. We talked about all the losses that she's gone through and God bless and God bless that family. Whatever they have gone through, please read that book uh, because I'm definitely excited for that book also as soon as I get it. And then it'll be all, all here, all the books that I have here signed by the author. Hopefully I'll make some arrangements with that author to get that signed. So here's one thing. Now, what we have learned is mental health is one thing that we should all talk about because it's so needed. Because we live in a time now that it's a value graphic world, not in a demographic world. And that's what I've learned. I've learned that when I lost my dad back in 2009. And I'm still learning that after so many years. But that, that's the name of the game, isn't it? There's no right and wrong answer. It's about how you feel at the end of the day. Now, as usual, as always, there's a quote today from Back to Basics, and I think my guest is waiting for that quote. And here's the quote. Life is 10% what you experience and 90% how you respond to it. Now, isn't that true? I think that's very true, isn't it? Now, as usual, as always, you know what I say, and I think Anita knows too. Everything in life goes back to basics, and that's what we did today, guys. Guys, take care. God bless. Please comment all my episodes because it will help me to make myself stronger that I'm giving you all the information as much as I can in those 30 to 40 minutes in my episodes. And there are three things. It makes this episode and every episode a hit. According to me, it's a hit. The topic, the guest, and definitely the host. Guys, take care. God bless. And I will see you next week on Back to Basics Season 2. Take care. Next week's episode on back to basics something that frustrates me but my um earliest years and on up until i was about 13 years old i had this experience with my father and um it just it wasn't a good one like i said he um sexually abused us and um he physically abused my mother and my sisters but he didn't physically abuse me uh, we did grow up in neglect and things of that nature and you know in hindsight and doing work on myself i do realize that um my mother did the best that she could to try to make sure that we were safe and things like mm. that. But she was also um, being abused. Mm.